Welcome to Schweitzer Drive, a podcast where we explore what goes on between the generation of electricity and the light switch. Join Dave Whitehead as he interviews the entrepreneurs, innovators, and experts who are inventing the future of electric power. Hi, I'm Dave Whitehead. Welcome to Schweitzer Drive. One of the most satisfying moments for an engineer is when a project that you've worked on helps somebody solve a problem. My guest today recently got to see a research project that he started more than 25 years ago help solve a problem for a country in the midst of a war. I'd like to welcome Dr. Manny Venkata Subramanian. I'm close, right? That's good. All right. Or as I like to say, Dr. Manny. Okay. And, and Dr. Manny is a distinguished professor in electrical engineering at Washington State University. The solution that Manny developed in collaboration with many of his WSU grad students is a suite of online monitoring tools that can detect harmful oscillations in a large power grid. Manny's solution helped Ukraine quickly and safely connect to the European power grid last spring. Manny also serves as the director of the Energy System Innovation Center at WSU and holds a joint appointment as a chief scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He earned his master's and doctorate of system science and mathematics from Washington University, St. Louis, Missouri. He was an invited member of the working group that studied the 1996 Western Interconnect blackouts and the 2003 Northeastern blackout. He serves as the chair of IEEE PES Working Group on Power System Dynamic Measurements. Welcome, Manny. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you so much for um, inviting me, Dave. This, this is going to be fun. I've been, I've been waiting to do this, this uh, podcast for a while. Manny, the, the story about the research being applied to help Ukraine is really cool, and it leads us into today's topic, power system oscillations. But... Before we get to that topic, will you explain the problem your technology solved and how the project came about? Uh, Dave, uh, we have had a series of research projects on um, power system oscillations over the years. It uh, started from the 96 uh, Western system blackout that we had here, and that was uh, caused by oscillations, which is why I got uh, interested in uh, both monitoring and solving the oscillation problems uh, for the power grid. And uh, recently, a few years ago, RTE, who is the French uh, grid operator, they had uh, noted our research in uh, PSERC, which is a power system engineering research center. That is a multi-university industry collaborative uh, program. And they were interested in uh, working with us on uh, testing our tools for operation in France. And uh, recently, because of uh, the progression of uh, renewables in uh, the European grid, the power flows in uh, the European power system have uh, become somewhat uh, unpredictable and I would say unexpected compared to what uh, they used to have. And that has led to some of the oscillations becoming poorly damped. And that was the reason uh, they were interested in working with us. And we had a research project with the RTE to implement our tools in the RTE power system. This was a few years ago. And over the last uh, three, four years, we have uh, improved our algorithms to work better with the European system. And just a few months ago in uh, February, they finally got the approval to license our tools for commercial use. And that was around the time when uh, Ukraine war was uh, starting. And as you know, on uh, February 24th, the Ukraine power system uh, separated from uh, Russia as part of a routine uh, experiment. And the very same day, Russia invaded uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. and they couldn't uh, reconnect with uh, Russia or they decided not to. So they appealed to Europe, the European uh, power uh, interconnection operator, ENSOE, to allow them to synchronize with uh, the European grid so that their system would be more stable. It's kind of risky to operate a large uh, interconnection such as uh, Ukraine without the support of uh, a big interconnection. So that was the concern at the time. 
and uh, the way it uh, developed, uh, the European system was going to synchronize with uh, Ukraine two or three years later. And whereas uh, because the war happened, all of this had to happen in a hurry. So they had to come up with a way to synchronize uh, the European grid and Ukraine with very little uh, studies to back up what to expect. So they were counting on tools such as what we have developed to monitor the synchronization in real time and to detect if there are any problems such as oscillations in the grid. And so since um, our tools were uh, licensed at the time, they had uh, our tools um, in their control center or they had a special room for um, monitoring this uh, synchronization. And uh, they said our tools worked very well to uh, give them the confidence that the synchronization went well. And the connection of uh, Ukraine to the European interconnection did not cause um, any oscillation problems for either Ukraine or for Europe. Um, I apologize for the long answer. No, that, that, <laughs> that, that, that's a great, uh, a, a, a great summary of, of what you were able to do. And now, and just a little bit of a follow-up question then, is the, the primary purpose of your tool just for the synchronization? Because lots of people have been synchronizing systems, right? I would imagine it's more about after you, you've connected the two systems together, if there was an oscillation problem, you probably have to separate or, or take some other remedial action schemes to, to damp the oscillation. And so was was your tool to to help protect the European side or was it for okay. the, the, yeah, that's the uh, Ukraine side? Yeah, that's an excellent question, Dave. Really, the our tool is not really targeted towards synchronization. It is to monitor and sort of uh, analyze uh, oscillations when they occur. And to point out if uh, the system is behaving normally or if it is uh, progressing towards a problematic uh, operation where the operators would have to take some actions. So the tools uh, during that uh, event and since then has been monitoring the connected system between Ukraine and now it is part of the European interconnection and to really provide alerts and alarms to operators uh, if there were some um, issues that uh, came up. And especially during the synchronization, it was useful because there was a little experience in how these two systems would operate uh, at that time. So tools such as ours was uh, useful to give them confidence that, yes, the system is uh, working well and that uh, it didn't cause any problem for either Ukraine or for uh, the European interconnection. That, that's and great. now it is all one. So oh, uh, Yeah. So that, <laughs> thank goodness, too, for the, the Ukrainian uh, people. You know, we've been talking a lot about oscillation. Maybe we need to step back just a little bit and describe uh, what they are. I mean, I could probably make an argument a power system is always oscillating, right? 60 times a, a, <laughs> a second, we get it up and we get it down. So there are oscillations. That's not quite the oscillations we're, we're, we're talking about. Maybe you could describe the types of oscillations and, and, the, and the problems uncontrolled or undesirable oscillations uh, have on, on the power system. Yeah, you are absolutely right. Uh, power system is an AC interconnection. So the uh, waveforms such as uh, voltages and currents and the way the power moves back and forth is at uh, 60 hertz um, synchronous frequency. Now, what we say is uh, normally the power transfer should be occurring at that frequency and at that frequency alone. Whereas um, if for some reason the power starts uh, fluctuating or the voltages and current uh, start uh, moving back and forth at frequencies, other than 60 hertz, that's what we call as uh, oscillations. And part of it is natural. When you have uh, some dynamic components uh, which are moving together in a couple fashion, which is what the power grid is, we have all these uh, bulk generators, uh, hundreds of them. Each of them have their own synchronous uh, motors or rotors uh, which are rotating, which produce the power from the mechanical side or now nowadays it is... Uh, from uh, solar and wind. So all these energy sources, they are coupled to this um, giant interconnection we call the power grid. Now, if any one of them change, because they are all interconnected, everything else will adjust a little bit to make sure that the system comes back to the normal 60 hertz. And there are various controls in the system which are designed to keep the system operating that way. But what can happen is, uh, so some of this is natural. But uh, what can happen is um, if those controls are not well designed, 
then the oscillations can last a long time or it can be poorly damped or undamped. And that's what we want to avoid. In the worst case, it can become uh, growing oscillations and that can lead to blackouts. And a simple example would be like uh, what we see, we have two kids playing on a seesaw. Normally, if both kids are well behaved, it should be a smooth operation. They jump up and down and that uh, they come back to some kind of a steady back and forth. But what can happen is uh, if one grid is um, aggressive and starts um, applying a lot of uh, pressure on one side, then the other kid may react and start putting more pressure on that side. So if you imagine if this goes back and forth, either the seesaw is going to break or one of the kids is going to get uh, thrown off the seesaw. <laughs> And neither of them is a good scenario. So in the power system context, uh, that can lead to either some lines getting tripped off and that can cause problems for the system or one portion of the grid separates from the rest of the system. So oscillations, if they are left uncontrolled or if the controls are poorly designed, then it can lead to that kind of a problem. So are there some known oscillation modes in the power system that are, are, are just present and I'm, I'm assuming that they're they're damped because if they weren't damped, if they were they, they were to, to grow uncontrollably, we'd probably split the power system apart. My light <laughs> light to go out. So, do we have some examples of what is a, a, a I don't know some 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 oscillations that we just expect to see in the power systems? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like um, if you have a set of uh, springs which are connected by um, a, a set of mosses which are connected by springs, then it will have certain natural resonant frequencies where the springs and uh, mosses will be moving back and forth. Just like that in the power grid, if you have all these uh, generators at various locations connected by transmission lines, when we operate the system, there will be certain frequencies where those controls are resonant with each other. And uh, typically those are uh, what we call as uh, the inter-area modes of the power grid. And uh, in the Western system, uh, the most famous one is... Uh, the, what used to be the 0.3 hertz or each period would take about three seconds of uh, swing back and forth of energy from the northern portion, say from Canada, the energy flows all the way down to California and then uh, it goes back to Canada and this happens uh, back and forth every three seconds. So we call that as like a 0.3 hertz oscillation. Now it's more like a 0 0.2, 0 0.25 hertz after uh, all the generation growth that we have had in the last 15, 20 years. And the other one is uh, 0.4 hertz uh, mode, which is like a 2.5 hertz uh, period. So there, the energy in British Columbia is swinging back and forth with uh, Alberta on one side and uh, California on the other side. Mm -hmm. So technically, California and Alberta are kind of, we say, in phase where they are both on one, either the high side of the swing or the low side of the swing, and British Columbia is like in the middle ah. of the swing. So that is another famous mode. We call that as the 0.4 hertz uh, mode, and that's very different from the 0.25 hertz mode, which is a north to south mode. So we call them by such names, by the geographical region, and then Europe has uh, east, central, west mode. Anyway, I'll stop there. Yeah. Is it... Uh so th these modes exist and they, they're, they're ongoing. Is there any desire to, to try to cancel? You know, I, I, yes, I, I so won't geek out too much, right? But <laughs> as engineers, right, we know how yes. to do pole zero cancellations and oh, okay. keeping all our, our poles in the left half plane versus yes, some kind of oscillation. So yeah, there, that's like, precisely the challenge, Dave, that uh, we want to keep all of these. These are the poles of the transfer function. And we want to keep all of these in the left half plane, like you say, yeah. well damped. And it shouldn't get anywhere near the imaginary axis or the damping shouldn't get near zero because then there is a danger that the oscillations persist for a long time. And then what happens is um, if the oscillations are poorly damped, the rotors which are producing power at uh, very high speeds, if they are subject to such uh, oscillations, then that causes vibrations yep. in the rotor shaft. And we can show that uh, that will reduce the lifespan of uh, expensive uh, rotor equipment. And it can also lead to unintentional tripping of uh, generators by either the operators or by relays, which would be, which can lead to, again, catastrophic uh, consequences.
So oscillations are going to exist no matter no Absolutely. matter what we're doing, right? But if they get they get out of control, then then we have to 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 take action. So understanding what the oscillation modes are on the power system is pretty pretty darn important. So what technologies have emerged to help us monitor and manage these these oscillations? Yes, uh, that is probably the most exciting development in the last uh, twenty years. That uh, now we can monitor the power system synchronously over wide geographical regions. How, how do you using, do that? Yes, using the synchrophaser technology or the phaser measurement systems that uh, we have, that was proposed by Professor Fortke back in the 70s, and it is, uh, the technology has really matured. And again, one of the big uh, differences have been made by your own company, yeah. uh, SEL, that uh, it's built into all SEL relays. So that has uh, sped up the adoption of the technology in the field. And now the cool thing is we can monitor what is happening in the power grid. Like I said, the oscillations can be between Alberta and California, which is thousands of miles away. But within a fraction of a second, we can find out how the signal in um, Alberta is lining up with the signal in um, uh, California. And we can see if the oscillations are well damped or if it is entering a domain where the damping factor or the damping ratio is becoming poor, so we can tell the operator you have to reduce the transfer between, uh, say, Canada to California to bring the damping back into normal operation. This is exactly what they are doing in France, that um, they use the PMUs between France and the other countries to monitor the modes in the European system, and then they have standing orders that... uh, if a specific mode, the damping becomes poor, then the operators ought to talk to the other country and reduce the flows between those countries. Um, and that was going to be my next question, right? It is uh, modes have probably existed on the power systems for, for, for quite a few years, especially when we start interconnecting and loads change and, and, and what have you. But I, I got to believe, though, with the integration of, of renewables, in, in particular the IBRs that don't behave necessarily like a, a, a synchronous machine or, or, or something like that, are introducing new challenges. In, are, 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 is there a difference in terms of the, the number of oscillations or the types of oscillations that are happening, say, in, in North America versus Europe? Because Europe is probably way ahead of the, the U.S. The smaller grids, a lot more uh, renewables introduced into their power systems. Are, are, are there differences between our, our, our two systems? First, uh, Dave, my European friends will be upset if you call their grid a smaller grid or small grid. (laughs) It's a much denser grid. How about that? It's much denser. I'm just joking. (laughs) I don't want to make anybody mad. I'm sure this is an international podcast, right? I probably mean all power systems are are special to me. How about that? Yes, yes, absolutely. (laughs) So you are right that uh, Europe is further along in terms of uh, adoption of uh, renewables in the grid for whatever reason. And that has uh, led to, and as you know, the renewables uh, bring two kinds of challenges. One, there is uh, technically no inertia associated Mm -hmm. with uh, solar and uh, type 3, type 4 uh, wind farms because uh, they are isolated by power electronics um, in how they couple with the power grid. And uh, Also, the controls on those uh, new devices are much more complex compared to what we are used to with the synchronous machines. Instead of one bulk synchronous machine producing, say, 500 megawatt, we have 250 or 300 uh, wind farms, which is producing the same amount of power. And again, in the the context of uh, solar, that would be like several acres of uh, hundreds of acres, maybe not hundreds, but... 10 acres that you would need to produce uh, that power using these tiny PV cells. So the technology is different. And also these um, renewables, the power output can change a lot from uh, whether from the environmental um, or the ambient conditions. And so that poses uh, some differences in how the power system itself behaves. In terms of uh, the power flow, the power flow can change rapidly from every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes. So the system operation becomes more challenging. And that is one of the differences I have seen in the European interconnection that um, may have led to the damping of uh, the modes becoming poorer compared to what we see here in um, North America. 
and also it may be cultural that uh, europe as you know is uh, each country on its own and there is really no central regulatory agency whereas uh, here in north america we have the north american um, electric reliability corporation yep which uh, sets the standards and uh, does the auditing for uh, adherence to the standards where uh, some of the major power system blackouts occurred because of, of oscillations yeah i think the most famous one is uh, the one that happened uh, here in our western system about uh, or exactly 26 years ago on august 10th 1996 and uh, that time um, because of uh, the forecast uh, missing by a few degrees the actual load was uh, higher by several hundred megawatt compared to what the operators had planned for and that led to the flows on uh, the important tie lines being uh, higher than what they should have been or what they were expecting and also that was compounded by um, several transmission lines uh, were out of uh, service or they got tripped because uh, they touched some tree and that led to them uh, being taken out and so the system was stressed and so the we could show that the damping of uh, this 0.25 hertz north south mode dropped from about 10% which is a more healthy value to something like uh, 3% which is really low then uh, there was an additional line tripping which normally shouldn't have really done anything it was like a 230 kb line trip uh, for a system as big as uh, the western interconnection that's like a drop in a you know a big bucket but uh, that uh, pushed the damping even lower and the damping went down to near 0% and then there was some uh, tripping of additional generation at miknari and that pushed it uh, to negative damping so as the damping became negative the oscillations started growing exponentially and this is what they teach us in um, our system theory class that a system should never have a pole on the right hand side and that's exactly what happened in the western interconnection and uh, that led to the oscillations going from uh, something like 50 megawatt to a couple of thousand megawatt oscillations in uh, one minute and so the system couldn't sustain those oscillations the relays tripped the tie lines and uh, that led to the separation of uh, the system into several islands and uh, we had a severe blackout that was the largest blackout uh, at that time in history then that was uh, <laughs> made um, small by the 2003 blackout that we had in um, northeast so a couple follow up questions and we're we're talking about oscillations and uh for all the power engineers out there the electronics engineers we're talking about uh you know uh poles in the in in the right half plane which is you, you never want them there because you're going to have an oscillation whether you want one or not um when i've always done those they're usually second order equation right really simple mm. right I, i with an op amp or something like that and and we get to figure out where the the poles are and map them onto to our uh, you know our our, our real and imaginary plane to figure out if we have a, a problem or not. A power system is a lot yeah. more complicated just, than the second order equation I, <laughs> I was describing here, right? There, there, you know, probably hundreds of, of, of points, right? And so does awesome your... Awesome observation, uh, yeah, Dave. That's really true. In the case of uh, Western Interconnection, I was involved in uh, modeling of that uh, blackout on computer simulations. And I was fortunate to be invited to that uh, study force, which you mentioned in the yeah. introduction. Yeah. and the model had uh, something like uh, 15000 states yeah so we are talking 15000 so the challenge is to make sure all of those poles are in the left half plane how and that how, is how did you guys solve that that yeah. matrix must have been huge for solving that yeah so that's again one of the and it's probably sparse the, yeah the power grid that uh, we have such a massive interconnection with uh, so many dynamic components like you say thousands of uh, these little controls everywhere and they are all working in coordination in such a nice way that the system remains stable most of the time i would say 99.9% yeah. of the time we don't have any problem even if we lose some components that's really the beauty of the power grid and that's the it, it, here's a little observation i had too is okay so we had the 1996 uh blackout we had the in, in the west the 2003 oh, can i say one more thing oh, sure. you asked about uh, how do we handle such um, 
large uh, system and uh, equations. Yeah. So that's again where the synchrophaser technology helps. That uh, even though we have all of these going on, in when we look at the synchronous uh, measurements, what shows up are the ones that are most important. The rest of them kind of uh, filter out or they die out on their own. Uh -huh. So when we look at the synchrophaser measurements, we will be able to tell which are the important modes that the system is getting excited at. And we can track whether those modes have adequate damping or not. So again, that's one of the advantages of uh, working with a real system with all these measurements. And again, for instance, in uh, Europe, they don't have a very good model for, I hope my European uh, friends don't uh, now, get upset with me. Now, neither this. of us are getting a Christmas <laughs> present this year. <laughs> but there is no good dynamic model for how to represent uh, the European grid. But again, what helps is the synchrophaser measurements. Okay, so now you have all these measurements all over the place and you can measure a point and you can probably uh, uh, define or, or calculate what the modes of the power system are. That's that's really cool. How do you take those measurements, those observations, those results, and then pinpoint it to, hey, that's an offending IBR or that's an offending what, whatever it is that's causing that? Is, is, it, is it that easy to figure out then where – what is causing the oscillation, or if you could remove one element from the the, the grid, that the, the oscillations would then damp out? Yeah, this is an excellent question as well. And this is part of the research that uh, several of us are pursuing. And we have, in fact, an ongoing uh, research project, which is funded by uh, ACL, to first uh, locate uh, the or to first uh, make sure the oscillation is either caused by a natural mode or sometimes it's also caused by Another mechanism we called as a forced oscillation, mm -hmm. which is uh, when something happens uh, not entirely at, within the power grid, but uh, it is an external mechanism such as uh, a valve uh, failing on a governor, which is a mechanical fault, but that valve can be flapping back and forth, and that becomes like an oscillation on the power output. Mm -hmm. So something like that, uh, an operator sitting in a control center cannot directly uh, control but like you said, if we can find out that this power plant, that controller in the governor is causing this problem, then we can make a phone call to the power plant to maybe trip that uh, unit or the governor to correct the problem. So this is uh, uh, the current research project that we are working on to first identify which is the guilty party, so to speak, or maybe guilty is too strong of it, which is uh, the faulty uh, equipment. Yeah. And then to help identify whether it's caused by a governor or exciter, or is it from an IBR, like you said. Yeah. And within, again, if you look at a wind farm, we have 100 or 200. Um, and then if you have adequate measurements, can we point out uh, which specific unit may be at fault? So that, that, that sounds like a... Uh a challenging problem to, uh, to, to, it's, it's my, my analogy is you're, you're sitting in the, the middle of a, a very, very large swimming pool and all these waves are, are coming at you, right? Mm -hmm. And one keeps coming over your head. How do you detect where the, what is causing that wave since you're in the middle of this, this ocean, if you will, or the big swimming pool and all of these are coming and trying to, to, I don't know, decompose or deconvolve all, where all the waves are, are getting generated from to figure out which is the, the, the one offending wave since you're sitting essentially in the middle trying to, <laughs> to trying to see where all this stuff is coming from. It, it, it's, it's fascinating, fascinating um, uh, and it, problem. And it's uh, especially challenging when um, the forced oscillation is uh, close to a resonant frequency mm -hmm. or one of those uh, natural modes because then when it excites the mode, like you said, the effect will be seen throughout the grid. Yeah. All the generators will be oscillating up and down. So to tell which is the the one that is uh, pulling everything up and down is not easy at all. And so we have some uh, exciting new technology that we have developed. We are going to be filing some uh, patents. So hopefully that will be oh, something we can talk about later. That, I'd love to have you back to talk about that. Let's, let's, let's go back. I, I was looking at the, 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 the numbers we were throwing out. 1996, you had the, the Western mm -hmm. uh, blackout. 2003, there was the Northeastern one uh, caused by oscillations. 
with all this this new IBRs or these these new generating sources and these more um, opportunities then for forced oscillations or or other other means uh, or, or or other oscillations. How come we haven't seen any more blackouts <laughs> lately? Right, we, we're making the power system more complex, and yet all of these things happened many, 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 many years ago. Are we are we smarter engineers these days? Are we getting lucky, or is it there's a black swan event that's going to happen uh, in the near future? I don't know. Yeah, that's again uh, something that uh, we should be very happy about that we haven't had a, a severe blackout uh, in the last uh, twenty years, though we have had some close uh, shaves or close calls, that there have been several events, both in the Western system, Eastern system, and in Europe, where we have had uh, forced oscillations uh, causing resonance with uh, the power grid. And they had one event in uh, Europe in 2016, where uh, mode uh, went to zero damping. Oh, wow. And fortunately, it stayed with uh, zero damping or like a stable limit cycle for several minutes. And that gave the operators an opportunity to adjust the tie line flows and they were able to pull it back to a normal condition or at least acceptable condition. So uh, I would say we have been fortunate, uh, Dave, that um, in spite of, like you say, all the changes that have happened in the power grid. And also, I agree with you, we should give credit to the engineers for uh, making the system behave so well with all the challenges that we have had, uh, both in um, terms of uh, the generation changes and uh, maybe the technology has helped us this is this is really exciting and and what i i, I find particularly uh exciting is the fact that you guys are thinking up stuff here at, at at WSU, but then you're also deploying solutions, right? Have practical solutions and, and applications like we talked at the beginning of the uh, uh, of the podcast. One of the projects was uh, uh, work that you've done with uh, San Diego Gas Electric on their on their WASA uh, project. Could you tell us a little bit about how you and, and, and WSU are helping out uh, San Diego Gas Electric keep uh, their, their power system stable? Yes. In fact, uh, that is one other area that we are collaborating with the SEL SCL has um, now developed a newer version of the synchrophase, synchrowave um, application, where uh, the synchrowave can now accept uh, third-party applications such as um, the ones developed by us uh, over the last uh, 20 years. So we are working with uh, SCL in integrating the tools that, for instance, we have implemented at RTE in France. We want to make those tools uh, become integral to the synchrowave application so that all the users will be able to use our technology and provide us more feedback on how we can improve them. And again, you know, you asked about STGND. So they were the ones who uh, provided us with some funding to work with uh, SEL on the integration. So we are really looking forward to providing that tool to STGND soon so that it can be used by them for their operation. Yeah, they're uh, they're a great bunch of engineers down there. <laughs> very, very forward looking on on how to make power systems even more reliable than than the, what they presently are. Um, you've been you've been studying oscillations and measurements for for the last twenty five years. I'm going to say at this point, you're deploying stuff at San Diego Gas and Electric. You've you probably almost got this this oscillation problem licked. Every PhD thesis I've ever read, the last sentence or the last couple of sentences end with "and further studies are required." <laughs> right? Because I don't know why you guys always do that, but you do. What 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 comes after studying uh, power system oscillations? What 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 do you see as one of the the next things that need to be uh, looked at and solved when it comes to to power systems? Yes, the great uh, challenge, or I would say, the opportunity we see is um, with these fast electronic controls, power electronic controls we have in IBRs. We have had these um, traditional thinking for how to design and operate the power grid using uh, uh, the controls such as uh, power system stabilizers. But we will have, like you said, continued uh, problems with oscillations, maybe with voltage stability, with uh, all aspects that uh, we all deal with as engineers. But I feel that uh, the... IBRs provide us a unique opportunity to rethink how we can operate these controls, how we can design these controls to make them do even better than what we could do with the traditional synchronous machine. So I think a big opportunity is in uh, working with uh, these uh, IBRs. And I have some uh, projects to get started on that and to really make the power system be ready 
for uh, introducing more and more of the IBRs because that is the challenge that we have for uh, the society that we have to transition the power grid from where we are today to more and more uh, renewable rich sustainable power grid of the future i i think you're absolutely right right traditionally we had a, a number of things. We had a big spinning mass that was, you know, mm-hmm. associated with a governor and an exciter, and that's about all the all that we had to control on the power system. Now with the, these IBRs, it's really a software control. They're so fast, right? We, and, and we can so do anything. Fast. They don't have to follow, you know, what our yeah. traditional laws of mechanical physics. Uh, if, the laws. Yes. Yeah, we yeah. we can program them to do whatever mm-hmm. we want to. So when you tar- start thinking about uh, power system stabilization and, and what we might mm-hmm. be able to do there, that's uh, that's going to be a I believe a, one a really a growing field of, of, of study, right, and, and vitally important as we introduce more of these, uh, I'll say, software controlled uh, energy sources. These IBRs, it's going to be incredibly important. So, I know I'll have to have you back on another podcast when we start talking about the the next generation of, of your research. So, uh, Manny, thanks very much for spending the afternoon with us and talking about power system oscillations. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank you, and I look forward to coming back. Thank you for stopping by Schweitzer Drive. Join us again as we learn about, explore, and celebrate electric power. For more information about the show, please visit selinc.com slash Schweitzer Drive.